The presentation today is very fitting. Uh, as some of you may recall, we started in early May with Andy Sumner, reflecting on the damage of COVID-19 for global poverty. And uh, today we uh, sort of come full circle and we're going to listen about the effects of poverty on lockdown compliance and the associated challenges, which have been many and very complex across most of the world. And to discuss this important topic, we have with us Professor uh, Olivier Bargain from the University of Bordeaux. Uh, Olivier uh, has a very distinguished career with uh, very important work on public and on labor economics. He is also a member of the Council of Economic Advisors to the French President, and he has been producing some of the very earliest and very exciting research on the links between COVID-19 and social behavior both in Europe and in developing countries. And he's going to focus on developing countries in our talk today. We also have with us uh, Amina Ibrahim, uh, who will act as a discussant to the presentation. Amina is a research associate at UNE WIDA, uh, based in South Africa. And Amina is going to discuss Olivia's paper and also give us a perspective about the evolution of COVID-19 in South Africa and its experience. So we look forward to hearing uh, from both. Before I pass on the word to Olivia and to Amina, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, I wanted to remind everyone that the uh, webinar is being recorded. All participants are going to remain muted. And uh, it would be really great if everyone could use the Q&A function to ask questions during, during and after the presentation. You will see the Q&A function right at the bottom of your screen, if you scroll down to the screen. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please post. I will be keeping uh, a, a, a track of all the questions and I will address them uh, to the presenters at the end. But please feel free to start whenever you have a question. Uh, so without further ado, thank you to everyone and thank you to the two presenters. And I will pass uh, now over to Olivia. He'll speak for 20 minutes and Amina will come afterwards. Olivia, very welcome. And over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot to Patricia, to Anna, Amina and all the team uh, at Rider for this uh, nice invitation and this nice occasion to present uh, latest work, uh, work on, the, on, on the topic of poverty and COVID in uh, uh, developing countries. Uh, this is a, a paper and its extension uh, that's uh, been co-authored uh, uh, with uh, Ulubek Aminjanov, who's also at the University of, of Bordeaux, uh, in our development team. And I will start with a quote from uh, a UN World Food Programme Executive Director that said, at the same time while dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we also uh, are on the brink of a hunger pandemic. And I think everybody has uh, gained consciousness over the past weeks and months that uh, there was a very high risk in many countries in the world uh, uh, about this. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, actually literature on India, but we're going to focus here on Africa and Latin America. Uh, I'm mentioning a few of the um, recent papers on the fact that, uh, on the fact that, that strict uh, Social distancing, strict lockdown uh, policies uh, is not uh, always fitting in the context of poor countries because indeed it puts these people at risk, especially uh, these people who live on daily informal jobs in uh, poor countries, uh, poor regions of the world, and for whom staying at home is not an option, teleworking is not an option, uh, and uh, for this uh, strict enforcement, uh, enforcement of lockdown policy might be uh, extremely uh, dangerous if that reduces their, their access to uh, to earnings and to uh, means to, to live. This is as simple as that. Uh, so I mentioned here a few a few papers. One of, of Patricia and the team at, at Wider uh, on an extremely interesting connection between this and the risk of social unrest through poverty and uh, variation also in social uh, capital in, in poor regions. Uh, a paper of uh, De Serf, uh, Chico Ferreira and uh, World Bank colleagues on, uh, on poverty and COVID. And uh, other, um, other contributions, the one from Martin Ravalian is, uh, was, uh, I think, a, um, an article in uh, VoxDev uh, focusing exactly on this, on, on this uh, issue here. 
mentioning also the work of uh, Robalino, saying, stating that indeed a large share of the population in poor countries does work informally and depend on daily income and cannot afford to stay home. So far, there was not that much evidence on the effect of poverty on, on compliance to uh, lockdown on, on health policies during the pandemic. Uh, and this uh, is uh, what we try to address here uh, today. So the uh, attempt here is to examine whether poor areas, poor regions in developing countries uh, indeed comply less with social distancing rule. Uh, and for that, we use uh, data that have been um, available for some time now, which are the Google mobility reports. Google has provided uh, indicators of mobility based on mobile phone information uh, at the regional level for many countries in the world. So we are going to use information about nine countries for Latin America and Africa, but I'll mention at the end that we actually have many more nowadays uh, as uh, throughout the month of June, Google has released information for now more than 40 countries. And we're going to illustrate what is the main result of the paper here is that people in high poverty regions actually move significantly more after or during lockdown compared to low poverty region, the region with less poverty uh, can afford slightly more to stay home and uh, be less exposed to uh, the danger of the pandemic. Uh, we will connect that to the actual outcome in terms of health, in terms of diffusion of the virus by looking at the effect of mobility on uh, the diffusion of COVID-19 and then connect the two elements of the equation and then look at how poverty rates increase your exposure and the, the rate of diffusion of the virus in the uh, sample of countries we are, we are considering here. Um, so again, the aim is to explore the pre-pandemic variation uh, across countries uh, and across regions of poor countries in terms of poverty level. So for that, we need a first ingredient, which is the pre-existing level of poverty at the regional level, measured as a share of population uh, of this uh, each region living uh, below a national or international poverty line. So we are going to use different types of poverty lines. The standard ones being the World Bank uh, $1.9 per capita per day as the extreme poverty line or the 3.2 or the 5.5. Um, we will use what is the official recommendation by each government in each country in terms of poverty line. And sometimes we will use alternative poverty line uh, compared to the World Bank ones, which are based on official poverty statistics or on the recommendation by local government, but not necessarily available. And we will have to recompute this poverty line using household survey data for these countries. So the nine countries under study are listed here, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru for Latin America, and Egypt, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa for Africa. Uh, we will use poverty in three different forms. A simple one, and I'll show you the results in graphical terms, which is really straightforward. Then it's uh, a simple way is to have binary poverty. That is regions, below the national poverty rate or above the national poverty rate. We can have a little more a variation by using tertiles, could be the uh, regions below the 25th percentile of national poverty, which we will call low poverty regions, as, uh, uh, and the, the regions in between the 25th and the 75th percentile, and the regions above the 75th percentile, the high poverty region or we can directly use the, uh, uh, the, the continuous measure of poverty. And in order to make it more comparable across country, we can also take the uh, Z-score, which is a form of standardized poverty uh, deflated by the uh, mean poverty level and divided by the standard deviation. Uh, the Google uh, Mobility Report, which is the other main ingredient of the uh, empirical exercise here, is a measure of how much people move. And during uh, the COVID period, and of course before the, the, the COVID period, as a benchmark. These are aggregated and anonymized data from users uh, of mobile device uh, using the location history uh, data in their uh, mobile phone. Uh, and it is measured as the number of visits or duration at, of stay at different location 
compared to this benchmark period, which is pre-COVID for the regional area that we are looking at, nothing happened at that time. Uh, that is uh, the month of January until uh, February 6. The type of mobilities are very interesting because you have things like retail and recreation, grocery and pharmacy, parks, transit station, which is how much time you spend at a train station or at a bus stop. But the main one we are looking at, of course, is workplaces. We want to know people go to work, as, as simple as that. And residential area is basically the time you spend at home, and that means not doing all this other activity and complying with uh, uh, lockdown policy. We are going to look at the month of February and April uh, until April 26. A lot has gone on until uh, in the more recent period, and I, I can say a brief word at the end, but um, this period is the, the most interesting one and the period for which we had the Google information when we actually started to work on that project. What you see here is a timeline. Zero is March 1. And uh, that's the mobility intensity. And you start with a level of 100 here when uh, uh, we are at, uh, in the pre-COVID period. And you see this big drop in mobility. You see some countries that really do uh, decrease their mobility a lot here, like uh, Colombia, for instance. You see some uh, countries uh, from uh, Latin America, like Brazil, with these strange policies. So there's a reduction, but it's not as much as for other uh, countries. And for some African countries here, uh, like Nigeria, you see the decline, which is kind of slow and uh, with a plateau, which remains quite high. Which also indicate that poor countries in Africa actually, on average, cannot really afford to decrease their poverty, uh, their mobility in terms of work, uh, uh, work mobility, work movement, as much as other parts of the world. If you put all this information now in uh, graphs, and I hope it's not too small, uh, and it, you can see, here we have the tercile uh, version of the poverty, with in pink the high uh, poverty region, the region with the high percentage of poor people, the purple one, which is a median uh, rate of poverty at the regional level, and the blue, which are, are the the lower uh, poverty regions. These are the uh, variation across all the regions uh, in our data, which are nine countries and more than 250 regions across these countries, showing that, again, that's the mobility in terms of work mobility, work going to the workplace. And compared to the January period, here in early March or late February, you were somewhere close to the uh, initial level, around 100. So it was very, very, very uh, similar. Uh, and you see no difference, and that's very important to say that, you see no difference between the high uh, poverty region and the low poverty region. They tend to behave in the, in the same way. We are going to use what econometricians and economists call a difference in difference approach, looking at before and after the uh, introduction of lockdown policy and the impact of COVID on these countries. And what's very important uh, in these uh, this methods is that the different groups that we're looking at tend to not necessarily behave in the same way, but at least uh, have parallel trends, have trends that are uh, common or parallel to each other in the period before uh, the things, things start. And what we've got here is that this, this three groups of poverty, three group of region, actually uh, not only behave in a parallel way, but even in the same way, as you see these three uh, lines actually do overlap almost completely, uh, which makes the point even stronger that there were really no difference between them before. What you see, and that's the, re the main result of this uh, research, is very simple. Uh, you see a monoton monotonic pattern here. You see that the, the regions with low poverty rates or at, at, at the country level are those who reduce mobility in terms of workplace more than the medium poverty region, which themselves reduce their mobility even more than the high poverty region. So the poorer you are, the less you reduce your mobility, meaning the more you still have to move out of your home to go to work and therefore to expose yourself really to uh, COVID-19. Uh, this was the result using the variation 
And you see this, uh, it's not only a line, you see the, the surfaces in blue, which are the, the, the confidence intervals at the 95% uh, level for uh, each group. And you see that this uh, confidence int interval do not overlap, meaning that the difference between mobility uh, reduction uh, across these three groups is uh, statistically significant. You see that for Latin America, we have the same, same kind of results, maybe not so strong. And for Africa, you see a lot of variation. Uh, and you also see that overall, Africa reduced mobility less than Latin America, showing that at the, now at the continental level or the red country level, then a poor country also cannot reduce their mobility as much as uh, slightly richer countries. But you also see an interesting variation across. Uh, across the different uh, uh, groups here. Another uh, piece of information is the, uh, the, uh, how these things uh, evolve uh, compared to other types of mobility. So here, in, again, in, in blue and, and red, you've got uh, that's going to be low poor, low percentage of poor and high percentage of poor, so the high poverty region and low poverty region for mobility, and we compare to the light pink and the light uh, uh, blue here for another type of mobility, which is recreational uh, activities. And we see that because it's less essential, then the mobility could reduce more. But most importantly, the difference between the two types of region is much smaller uh, in this case. Same here, going to the grocery that, or the pharmacy that reduce less because these are vital activities, very essential activities. But again, there's no reason for the poor and the less poor to behave differently in that respect. And you see that the difference, again, between the light pink and the light blue is small compared to the difference between uh, the two types of region in terms of work mobility. Same here for transit station. Um, I will just skip all the technicity and just focus on uh, uh, the essential uh, result. Uh, if you look at this, uh, estimates here in pink, it is the uh, actual difference between the pink and the blue, between the high poverty region and low poverty region, compared to the pre-COVID and pre-lockdown announcement era. Uh, I forgot to say one important element here is that the, the dash line here, March 20, is the date that we are uh, using as to define the before and after uh, situations. And that's actually what we use in this estimation. But again, the, the results don't really change too much compared to this. Uh, to, you could choose some date that is more in line with, for instance, the uh, World Health Organization uh, date of announcement that COVID was a pandemic, which is March 11, uh, and which is more in line also with the lockdown announcement in Latin America, uh, or slightly la uh, later for, for Africa. But this, uh, this choice of the cut time cutoff is not uh, uh, extremely uh, important. The effect is so strong that it is not sensitive to it. So what you see here is this number, three or four, that out of a scale of 100, uh, the, uh, the, the, the impact of being in a high poverty region compared to a low poverty region in terms of your mobility, this is uh, uh, in terms of, uh, I, I can mention later on, in terms of elasticity, what it, uh, it means, but uh, you see that it's around three or four point of percentage difference between this type of region. And we see here that the uh, effect is much larger in Africa compared to Latin America. And you restore a bit of the effect for Latin America, America once you exclude Brazil, which is uh, an outlier for the reason that we, we know. Um, I will, uh, time is running and I don't want to, uh, push too far, but what we see here is that the estimate that I was talking about around four uh, for work mobility is not uh, found when it comes to uh, retail and recreation or going to the grocery or transit station, the other type of mobility. So that's what the point I was making when I was showing the, the graph with light blue and light pink uh, um, curves. Uh, we don't see a difference between the poor region and the rich region, or not rich, but the poor region and the less poor region uh, in terms of this other type of mobilities. And the zeros here are just uh, 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 p-values for the difference between this coefficient and the coefficient for work mobility, meaning that we 
have uh, an absolute rejection of the equality of these numbers here. That means that there is extremely significantly a larger drop in mobility across uh, uh, poverty regions here uh, for work compared to the, uh, the other uh, type of mobility. So it's really a work story. It's really a going to work type of, of, of story. The last element I would like to convey to you today is how does it translate in terms of diffusion of the virus? Uh, we have here uh, an estimation of what we've just uh, seen today here was an effect of poverty on mobility. The um, effect is, if I take for instance, a one star deviation uh, in poverty. So the difference between two regions that are uh, one standard deviation difference from each other leads to, for instance, uh, a 10% difference in, in mobility. So the, the number we've seen before, three or four points of percentage, looks small, but a standard deviation is a, 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 a standard, a, a very regular type of metric to actually assess how much variation there is across regions. And it's true also within countries. And this type of normal difference across regions in terms of poverty uh, leads to a variation in terms of mobility of 10%, which now start to, in terms of magnitude, start to, to become relatively important. But we want to go beyond that. We want to go beyond the causality between, from poverty to mobility. We also want to show how much an increased mobility or a smaller reduction in mobility leads to uh, an increased diffusion of COVID, which we measure in terms of upcoming growth rates of COVID-19 cases we find that a 10% increase in mobility, which was about the effect of our one startup deviation uh, difference in poverty, a 10% increase in mobility or difference in mobility between two regions leads to a, around 4, 5% increase in the epidemic growth rate. Again, it might seem kind of a small uh, variation, but as we had uh, uh, exponential diffusion of the virus, tamed somehow to some extent by, by the policy in, in place or by the, the lockdown behavior at different degrees, uh, this uh, upcoming growth rate of COVID can actually over weeks materialize into a quite large number of, uh, of additional cases. If you take um, the um, average in these nine countries in Latin America and Africa, we had around 200 case, cumulated cases recorded by March 20, which is, if you remember, the cutoff point that I, I used to say that there was an after and uh, a before and an after in this kind of difference in difference approach. And uh, by May 3rd, uh, which is the end point in, uh, if we look at the two week forward um, COVID diffusion after the last data that we've got in terms of Google mobility report, then we end up with more than 22,000 cases on average at the country level across the same country. So what we see here is that the elasticity that we, uh, that we have uh, calculated, uh, this difference of around four or five percentage points in the growth rate of COVID would lead to a, an additional 2,500 cases uh, by May 3rd. So it's 10% and it's quite uh, 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 a lot in, in the end, even though the initial percentage look uh, small. I would conclude, and I'm already uh, past the, the, the time, and I'm sorry for the, the chairwoman, um, who promised not, not to interrupt me, she was very kind, but uh, I really have to, 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 uh, to wrap up. Um, poor people whose livelihood depends on casual labor are less likely to comply with social distancing requirements, even though they were strict or, or, or less stringent uh, across countries. What we calculate is an average effect. And we actually illustrate that here um, by showing that indeed uh, countries with uh, uh, a high rate of poor people in these uh, regions are um, in a way complying less by reducing their mobility less. One drawback might be that we use Google Mobility Report that are based on the fact that people actually have a mobile phone. We have checked and uh, despite the high poverty in of some region, uh, the penetration rate of, in terms of smartphone and mobile phone is extremely high. In the worst case, what would happen is that we would underestimate the true effect of poverty on compliance to this uh, health uh, measure, uh, simply by the fact that uh, in the 
in the poverty region, in the high poverty region that we are looking at, uh, only the less poor have actually have a, have a mobile phone. So the, the, the less compliance, the lower rate of compliance in this high poverty region uh, would be even stronger if uh, uh, we could actually measure the poverty of the extreme poor or the poorest in the high poverty region. Um, maybe we'll discuss more uh, some extend, extension of this result uh, in, the, in, the, in, in what comes next, but uh, I just wanted to end by saying that we now have this similar result for more than 40 countries in the world and more than uh, 500 regions using the latest release of Google uh, Mobility Report. And we also find a strong effect of the policy uh, response and the income support that have been put in place in many countries, uh, an effect on mobility and exposure to COVID, but also a reduction of this gap between the high poverty and low poverty region that we uh, have shown in the, in the result today. I should stop and sorry for going beyond my, my time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Olivier. Fascinating presentation and really interesting results. Um, I'll ask now Amina to um, discuss the results and speak about South Africa. So Amina, 10 minutes. You will need to unmute. Uh, thank you, Patricia. Uh, I just want to share my screen. So you get to see my presentation. Okay. Um, so thank you, Olivia, for a very interesting and thought-provoking um, presentation and paper. Um, and so I've been considering what this uh, rock, play, rock and hard place is uh, in South Africa while we remain in lockdown and maybe I can share some uh, light on, on the scenario. Um, okay, so the paper is interesting as it considers the challenges to the lockdown where large parts of the population are forced uh, to work uh, to escape extreme poverty or hunger. Uh, and it considers the impact of the responses to COVID and not the, the impact the virus itself. And so I guess in, it adds to the literature in terms of the economic impact versus the health impact. And there's a large discussion going on about that in South Africa at the moment. Um, and then we also, you know, the paper also moves on into this discussion on estimation of how high uh, poverty rates translate, translate into faster spread. Um, and through this channel of increased work mobility. So, so your findings uh, are suggesting that lockdown is um, challenging, if not uh, almost impossible for poor areas. Uh, and this is now proxied by your this mobility, Google mobility data. Um, and this is interpreted as the necessity for, for people to actually go out and work and earn and this really difficult trade-off between between poverty or getting getting the virus um, and i think this combination of the google mobility data then your survey data on poverty rates and the COVID data is actually a pretty interesting nexus so despite lockdown measures uh, the virus has spread considerably and in south africa epidemiologists suggest that we are only now entering the peak phase which could last perhaps even until september um, and so these are just the nine countries uh, that um, that are under examination in your paper. And I just wanted to see where South Africa kind of lies. Um, and they sort of South Africa is kind of in the middle. Um, but it's nice also to see where the that these countries actually, you know, had their first cases uh, in a very similar period. Um, but the one thing I, I, I guess I missed um, maybe from your paper, and I mean, we haven't spoken about it in your presentation so far is, I know a lot about the lockdown and what's been going on in South Africa, but I know less um, about lockdowns in other countries and kind of some similarities and differences uh, would have helped me to contextualize uh, some of this information. So in South Africa, the lockdown was initially viewed as a necessity to flatten the curve. Um, and what the lockdown has done really is bought the South African government time to prepare the health sector. And 
lockdown is just one of the collection of strategies uh, for the government, uh, where it's including social distancing and preparing or assisting with uh, businesses in looking at mitigation strategies at the workplace. But we also know that lockdown cannot f continue forever. It logically has to finish at some point. And the virus is still going to exist once the lockdown ends. And we cannot, we just simply cannot wait um, until there's a virus, until there's a vaccine rather, um, because we have no end date, we have no idea when that'll happen. Um, some say 18 months, but uh, there's a lot of uncertainty around that. And then of course, a complete lockdown is not possible in South Africa, but anyway, right? So um, in South Africa in particular, people don't have the kind of savings where they can um, hoard or collect food supplies for uh, long periods of times. Um, and so, and we also require essential services. So we need our hospital staff and we need our municipal workers. And the government was very specific and published a list of essential workers that actually needed to go out and work. Um, but we also need transport, um, our transport workers and our grocery stores workers uh, to keep moving about um, and returning to their workplace each day. So in South Africa, our lockdown actually started on the 27th of March, which is quite close to your 20th of March um, in your estimation. So we've been in lockdown for 102 days already. Uh, we have a staged lockdown uh, set up in South Africa. Uh, where the first uh, five weeks we were in level five lockdown and this only permitted essential services to move around. So you weren't permitted to leave your home. Uh, there was a curfew in the evening, even for those on the essential services, you needed a permit to go out um, and you could only leave your home to get groceries. We moved to level four uh, in the, on the 1st of May. Um, and so more movement was permitted. So the curfews were extended, uh, but people only permitted to actually leave their homes in the morning for exercise purposes between the hours of 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. We're very specific about this. Um, and then we're currently under level three of lockdown and that started on the 1st of June. And this includes some business travel uh, and then some phase return to work and schools, um, but those also have their own, their own set of challenges. So the rock and the hard place uh, in South Africa is what I sort of, want to touch on. South Africa has a set of challenges related to lockdown, some of which are sort of broadly touched on in the paper. Uh, the density, um, as I want to show you in this picture, this photograph, uh, is actually much higher in poorer areas. So the top part of the photograph has uh, a poorer community, um, which is, I guess, more dusty and uh, very tightly packed. And then you've got a less poor or rich community on the other side, where everything's very spaced out and, and green. Um, and so your poor areas, um, so the density of, in poor areas are, two, are twofold. One is actually you're closer to, you know, households are actually closer together, but within households, there are more people uh, living together. Then the second thing that affects, but both, um, both, low poverty areas, high poverty areas, perhaps more so the high poverty areas, is that schools and daycares have been closed. Um, and what this means, I think, for people who do have to go out and work, both essential workers or informal workers, is that they need to then, if there's nobody else in their household to look after their children, uh, they actually need to hand their children over to somebody else to look after them, whether it's a neighbor or it's a grandparent. Uh, and so that's actually increasing your interaction with other people. Uh, and the last point um, that I've been thinking about is this, South Africa's got these high levels or still has high levels of HIV and TB. Um, and so they've, we've got a population with, with lots of comorbidities. And these, in some cases, these comorbidities are um, located in poor areas. Uh, so, so, so the Western Cape uh, or the areas in and around Cape Town actually have clustering of TB in certain areas. And this would also exacerbate the spread of the virus. But overall, I think we can, um, we can buy into the argument that mobility, work mobility has a severe consequence in poor areas. So what has the South African government done to reduce 
the need for poor people to go out and earn their wage. The first thing that they did uh, very early on was there was a cap on prices of essential items, easing the burden of the poor. Um, and there were several complaints lodged and the government's taking action against businesses who were price scourging. The second is social relief of distress, food parcels and vouchers. Um, and so this is part of the government strategy. This came in a little bit later. Um, but civil society has also been pretty active in supporting these efforts with large-scale food distribution. And this is a, a photograph of this food distribution uh, in, a, in a poor neighborhood in Cape Town. Uh, and then the, the last uh, point I want to mention about the support is that there has been an increase in social security. Again, this may, be, may have come a little bit late, um, but there were two parts to this. One was a top up of existing grants. Um, so child the child support grant, which reaches a number of families um, and has been in place for quite some time, uh, but also a new grant for those falling outside of the social security system, informal workers um, in particular. The reality, though, is that this didn't all go, um, go smoothly. So Broadly, the measures were, they garnered support and they were perceived as necessary, um, a necessary response from the government to the looming hunger crisis. The photo on the right uh, of our residents from several informal settlements in Kalija who gathered and they were demanding water uh, during the lockdown. Um, and this is people sitting on the steps of the you know, municipality building, but there have been violent food protests and looting of businesses uh, all over the country as well. Um, and this pandemic has certainly highlighted problems uh, in, social, in South Africa's social security system. Uh, and now that more people are more heavily reliant on this system, these issues have been exacerbated and they don't simply disappear. Um, in some ways, the, these measures also assume that the state is capable of scaling up their social security system. Um, and so there are lots of problems in terms of impl implementation uh, of actually these, these social security, uh, such as we have a system now where those who need a new grant, a special grant, have to go out and apply for it. Um, and a number of people haven't actually been approved for their grant you know, further delaying the access to the money or maybe they won't access it again if they don't try and actually fight the system. So it becomes quite difficult uh, for those who are in desperate need to do so to actually access the money that the government actually set out for them. Uh, and then there's been corruption and food, food parcel corruption in particular. Uh, and this is in two forms. One is where the food parcel just doesn't actually reach the people at all. Somebody else has pocketed the money somewhere along the way. Um, and the other way is where leaders uh, have um, provided food parcel parcels only to the, those in their constituencies. Um, and so this makes for a fairly challenging and tense situation in South Africa. Uh, and it's not clear where we go from here um, because these challenges are not new and it seems difficult that we'd be able to fix them during a pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amina. Um, I will start by throwing in two questions which link very directly to uh, Amina's discussion and uh, perhaps Olivia, you could address them a bit further. First is on uh, levels of formality and informality. Is there a way where your analysis could be correlated? Uh, I know you're doing it at regional level, so it's very difficult to kind of pinpoint uh, areas where you might have slum areas and formal settlements and so forth, but is there a way of correlated with, uh, with levels of uh, work informality? And the second one is, you mentioned right at the end, very um, interesting point about social assistance programs um, dampening the effect uh, of, of poverty uh, on the compliance, which links with what Amina was saying about the social protection program in South Africa and many places in the world. You know, the governments have tried to implement some kind of social safety nets. Uh, could you maybe talk about a bit more about these and how, um, and whether you have some insights about the levels or the type of programs that may be working. Um, I know this is new research, but perhaps you could, those points could be, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. Uh, I'll, Olivia, if you. Um, 
Thank you very much. I will um, share my screen again with you. Can you see? Yeah. Okay. Um, I've just run in real uh, time and life uh, an estimation for South Africa, which uh, I had, but I had for the binary poverty and here we have actually that's from the three uh, uh, groups that I was showing before like the the low poverty medium poverty and high poverty if you take the two extremes uh, as you can see here the result that we had applies to South Africa as well with the high poverty region um, uh, reducing the mobility less than the, the lowest tertile of, of poverty region uh, if we have just binary group, we can overlap, and there's not so much difference in South Africa uh, across a, a re region that we had on average. But if we take really six extreme cases, then it, it does work. Um, another point that I'd like to make is that we, we had to use a lot of countries and a lot of regions because if you use only country variation, or if you focus on one country, of course, you can. Uh, it's 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 uh, very interesting as you just did, and it, it helps to really tell a story. Uh, but if you want to have an overall, like a global view of the effect of poverty on uh, higher exposure to COVID, then you you need to use regional variation across many countries. Even country variation itself is complicated because we know that country would indeed uh, design maybe their policy response to the overall poverty level of the of the country itself, etc. So there there. Are, many confounding factors that come into play. Well, you, if you use regional variation, and in your estimation, you have region fixed effect as we, we had, then, then you, you, you escape from, from some of these, these issues. So we, we, for what we did, we really had to uh, use the, the, uh, the, the variation across countries and, and many regions uh, in, the, in the world. Um, but that said, uh, the, the point we've made on average is, true in general. And as you see on this graph, uh, for, for several countries, uh, Colombia, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, uh, at the bottom, Chile is, a, we don't see something extremely strong. Yeah, actually it goes the other way around for, for, for Chile and Brazil has this strange policy as we know. So these are our two outliers. But other, otherwise, for many countries in the world, you see here El Salvador, Honduras, uh, Mexico is also a bit of an outlier, but uh, not that much. Paraguay, Peru, Uruguay, uh, etc., uh, Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Philippines. Our story also work at the, at the, at the level of each, each country. The, 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 the last point I'd like to make is related to policies, and you, you, you've, you've, um, uh, it was extremely interesting to see more closely at what's going on within a country in uh, South Africa. If we look at the global picture again, uh, then uh, you've got here, uh, to take for instance the graph on the right, uh, these are the variation in mobility and reduction in mobility during COVID time uh, across uh, now three groups of, of countries or regions, which are uh, uh, the, the variation in terms of income support. You, you mentioned several. Uh, Policy designs, uh, this is an overall picture. We will dig into the nature of the, the policy schemes that are put in places. Uh, uh, but here it's the overall in type of income support, the outstanding income support beyond normal social assistance uh, that has been put in place uh, during COVID time. And you see that region with no income support to reduce mobility much less. And you see the, the, the mobility rate still extremely high compared to those with uh, low income support in purple and in blue, those with a high income support. And the point we were making about difference across regions in terms of poverty, uh, you see that the income support actually does reduce this gap. Uh, here on this graph here, you've got uh, the, the light pink and the, uh, the, and the red, uh, which are the uh, low poverty region and high poverty region, uh, which don't receive any income support. And you see they don't reduce our mobility that much. And we've got this gap the one that I was uh, pointing at during the, my presentation. And in blue, you see uh, the light blue is the uh, low poverty region and the dark blue, the high poverty region in countries with uh, uh, receiving any form of income support. Uh, and you see that 
first of all, their overall mobility has reduced much more than the, the pink curves here. Uh, but also the difference between high poverty region and low poverty region has shrinked, meaning that uh, this, this support, this, this policy responses have managed to reduce the difference in exposure to COVID across uh, the regions in this country. I hope it uh, uh, answers some of the, 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 the concern or question, and I'm very happy to answer two more. Uh, great, and um, there was also the question on informality versus formality. Uh, Olivia, whether you'd have some insights on that? Yes, it, it, it's a very, very good point. We, we thought about that at first. We thought about actually the, the trust issue that, that you're addressing in, in uh, uh, the, the paper I mentioned in my introduction um, as we had worked on that for, for Europe. Uh, and we, on the labor market side, we have thought about informality. In the end, we focus on poverty as it's in the most pressing uh, question. Uh, but that said, I also motivated our, our empirical work to uh, the argument of the fact that the poor people have to go to work and these, work are, these jobs are informal jobs. The thing is that there's not probably not innovation across region in terms of the nature of the labor market. You have informal workers everywhere. Uh, we could try, we could attempt to look at the, uh, the variation across region in terms of, of the rate of informal work and to see if it has an effect and could uh, be a complement to the, to, to, to the story we were, we were telling. And it's definitely extremely important. Great. Um... I have a couple of questions here uh, related to the data. Uh, so the Google Mobility data, um, I think it's, it's been quite widely used now uh, amongst researchers looking at various effects of COVID-19. Um, can you say a bit more about how the data is generated and also about the re reliability? You, you mentioned, uh, you know, the difficulty of, of, uh, um, I I of capturing some of these effects in developing countries where the use of smartphones might not be very uh, well used, etc. Could you maybe uh, talk a bit more about how the data is generated and uh, uh, how reliable? it is and whether there are any sort of sources, uh, any alternative sources for which robustness testing could be done? Yes, that's a critical point, obviously. The Google Mobility reports uh, uh, give some scores in terms of, 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 of indices, in terms of, of mobility intensity, um, which is based on so the, the, the time spent at near uh, location that correspond that are identified by Google as being hubs for transport or uh, pharmacy, grocery, parks, etc. Uh, rather than the time you spent in your uh, identify as your normal uh, residence uh, location or uh, area uh, that are uh, identified as your daytime uh, job location. Um, so based on, on, on the mobility itself, the movement itself, or the duration, uh, combined, this information leads to yield this, uh, this course in terms of mobility in different type of activities. The second point is, uh, so the critical one is, uh, is it representative? Uh, we've got here um, uh, on this, should this uh, graph here, it's a rate of penetration of um, mobile phones, so it's not necessarily uh, smartphone, but um, that's the num as you see, there are different type of indicators uh, in the third column, uh, but that's usually the number of access per 100 inhabitants or the number of uh, cellular phone per 100 inhabitants. And uh, of course, some people can have more, more than one phone or more than one SIM card or one more, one more uh, subscription because they share with of the member in the family and so on. So this rate can be above 100, but they are very high, even in uh, countries like, uh, uh, like Kenya or uh, Nigeria, uh, the, the, poor, the poorest country in, in the list here, uh, and South Africa as well. So it, it, people, and even poor people have, have mobile phone. Uh, I think it has become extremely important for for everyone around the globe to be able to, to stay in touch, to communicate. And you know, there's a lot of literature and economics on how mobile phones are used for access to credit, for instance, as you uh, have uh, access to different type of uh, credit operator through uh, mobile phone uh, in poor regions. So 
Uh, it is not exactly the idea, uh, the preconceived idea that poor regions don't have uh, a smartphone or mobile phone. They do have. Um, but indeed, as I explained earlier, I, 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 maybe we're we are wrong, but I, our intuition is that uh, the bias that can operate here and the fact that the extreme poor may not have as much as the less poor, then that would tend to, uh, to underestimate the effect of poverty that we are highlighting in, 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 in our, our work. And the, the, the things are probably more, even more so than the, the gap between low, low poverty region and high poverty region that we, 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 we obtain. Uh, simply because of the fact that indeed the poorest people may have less uh, uh, rate of, of, of smartphone uh, holding than, than, than others. Even though there are those who probably still have to commute or to go to work more. So we probably have a lower bound of the true effect uh, of, of poverty. Great. Um, a question now to, uh, for Amina. Um, so you, you, you've discussed uh, I mean one, one interesting uh, or one um, uh, worrying consequence of some of these issues is a is, uh, 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 rise in social unrest and um, we have a paper at UNUI that addressing some of those issues and uh, Amina you referred this to the case of South Africa and uh, that seems from what you said it seems like this has happened even while cash transfers and a variety of also other social programs were being implemented. Um, so does that then indicate that these programs perhaps are not having the effect that they should have or where would these sort of protests be coming from? What is, what is your sort of understanding of what's going on? So I think it's a, it, I mean, part of it's that it came a little bit too late. Um, and so when you've got a large community that is very hungry, um, you, I mean, the video footage of trucks driving into poor communities and people just kind of storming the truck um, and you grab as many bags as you can instead of, you know, standing up and queuing and waiting for your bag of food. Um, and so there's, there's that kind of um, response uh, that's been happening. Um, and then it's also, um, I guess, part of the corruption story, right? Because if you, or, you know, some people are getting the food uh, parcels and others are not getting the food parcels, um, you know, they, that creates difficulties within a, within a community as well. Um, and what goes hand in hand with this kind of social unrest, um, in particular in poor communities, is um, police enforcement and uh, in the case in South Africa is police brutality. So in the early days of um, the lockdown, there were actually more cases of people who, were, who had died from, um, at the hands of police than people who had died from the virus itself. Um, and so this is, I mean, then this ties into the whole discussion about work mobility, going out, uh, you can't, you know, physically be in a small space with a lot of people all the time. Um, so very, very challenging situation in terms of compliance um, in South Africa. Okay, well, um, we're getting to an end. We have about a couple of minutes left. Uh, so I would take the opportunity now at this point to just ask, any final words from both of you? Uh, and I know we have an audience that is particularly uh, sort of uh, interested in the policy implications of some of these results. So I guess the question here coming up is, what, what can we do? You know, social protection is coming too late, unrest is increasing, poverty makes it impossible uh, to, for many, many people to stay at home. What can we do? So, Olivia would like to go first, or Amina? <laughs> you <want? laughs> um, well, I think this is a terrible time, and at the same time, it's an outstanding time uh, because, as we thought, that we couldn't increase debt and, and help people also in rich countries. Uh, we, we realized that we are able to to actually uh, unblock situations. So there's this huge question about uh, the, the debt of, of, of poor countries uh, that's on the table. But there's also in research um, and, and for policy making an extraordinary time uh, as we can really now see how this outstanding targeting or, or universal transfer or whatever the form it took, uh, what effect it has not only on 
on, on of course, on helping people in, in our time, and uh, but also try to, 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 to see how much it has reduced, how it's able to reduce inequality, how much it, it's able to, to help people in, in, in the longer run, uh, maybe to infer from, <clears throat> not, for instance, from the mobility <clears throat> figure I, I, I showed, but for, for other type of indicator, to invert it to find how much the reduction in poverty gaps across regions of the world um, uh, happened during that, that time. And of course, it's only it's bound to be a temporary time. Uh, but if some of this support, some of this cash transfer, some of this help and aid could uh, be sustained, and because we have seen the, their effects and their effectiveness, um, and, and if we could monitor and measure that, uh, there are several World Bank reports that actually provide a lot of um, interesting information, like Gentiloni and uh, et al. and so on, on, on the, the nature of, of policy response across the countries, all the countries of the world. Uh, and if we could monitor that over the, the, the next month and, and the next years uh, and see which of these programs remain and how much you can help people, then it is a, a fantastic opportunity to, to seize uh, in, that, in that respect. I think that's the main message here. Uh, so I think I have two points. Um, one, I think, I mean, in theory, it's nice to have uh, an, a new social uh, grant and uh, have this value and tell everybody about it. But I think the implementation is important because you can't actually get that money to people. Um, you know, you're going to continue with the social mess. You're going to continue with the um, looting and um, just very uh, tense situation. Um, and then the other thing that I think the South African government's messed up with a little bit um, is that initially they had announced that they would have a top up of the child support grant specifically. Um, and so the child support grant goes to each child under a certain age. Um, but it later transpired that actually it wasn't going to work out that way. It was going to be just a top up for the household. Um, so whether there was one child in the household or five children in the household, you were all just getting X amount of money. Um, and so that's not necessarily helping. So you're going to need the, the, the top up in terms of the cash transfer, but you also still need the food parcel. Um, and so you're going to need this combination of policies to get, uh, to get us to where we need to be. Thank you. Very true. Thank you very much. We are completely out of time now. So um, it's left to me to thank you both for fascinating presentations. And uh, it, it's, it, it's really a great opportunity to see these early results about what, how COVID is affecting so many uh, people across the world, not everyone. And uh, I'll take the opportunity to uh, wish everyone a good break, a good summer break, wherever you are. And uh, hope to see you all back um, after it. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. And thank you to all the participants that have stayed with us over the next uh, last couple of months. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.